Hey there. Our uh, story for today is um, one by James Harriet. Uh, he was a veterinarian for years and years in England and has a lot of great stories. So uh, this is out of one of his bigger books. So this is just like a chapter, but it's titled The Christmas Day Kitten. And it's illustrated by Ruth Brown. <clears throat> Christmas can never go by without my remembering a certain little cat. I first saw her when I called to see one of Mrs. Pickering's much-loved basset hounds. I looked in some surprise at the furry creature moving quietly down the hall. I didn't know you had a cat, I said to Mrs. Pickering, who is plumpish, pleasant-faced woman. Mrs. Pickering smiled. We haven't really. Debbie is a stray. She comes here two or three times a week, and we give her some food. I don't know where she lives. Do you ever get the feeling that she wants to stay with you, I asked. No, Mrs. Pickering shook her head. She's a timid little thing, just creeps in, has some food, and then slips away. She doesn't seem to want to let me to help her in any way. I looked at the little tabby cat again, but she isn't just having food today. It's a funny thing, but every now and again, she pops through into the sitting room and sits by the fire for a few minutes. It's as though she is giving herself a treat. The little cat was sitting very upright on the thick rug, which lay in front of the fireplace in which the coals glowed and flamed. The three Bassets were already lying there, but they seemed used to Debbie because two of them sniffed her in a bored manner, and a third merely cocked a sleepy eye at her before flopping back to sleep. Debbie made no effort to curl up or wash herself or do anything other than gaze quietly ahead. This was obviously a special event in her life. A treat. We're all just enjoying the fire. <clears throat> then suddenly she turned and crept from the room. Without a sound, she was gone. That's just the way it is with Debbie, said Mrs. Pickering, laughing. She never stays more than ten minutes or so, and then she's off. I often visited the Pickering home, and I always looked out for the little cat. On one occasion, I spotted her nibbling daintily from a saucer at the kitchen door. As I watched, she turned and almost floated on light footsteps into the hall, then through into the sitting room. Debbie settled herself in the middle of the pile of basset hounds in her usual way, upright, still, and gazing into the glowing fire. This time, I tried to make friends with her, but she leaned away as I stretched out my hand. However, I talked to her softly, and I managed to stroke her cheek with one finger. Looks like a nice little kitty. Then it was time for her to go. Once outside the house, she jumped up onto the stone wall and down, and was, and down the other side. The last I saw was the little tappy figure flitting away across the grassy field. I wonder where she goes, I murmured. That's something we've never been able to find out, said Mrs. Pickering. <clears throat> it was three months later that I next heard from Mrs. Pickering, and it happened to be Christmas morning. I'm so sorry to bother you today of all days, said Mrs. Pickering apologetically. Don't worry at all, I said. Which of the dogs needs attention? It's not the dogs. It's it's Debbie. She's coming into the house, and there's something very wrong. Please come quickly. I drove through the empty market square. The snow was thick on the road and on the roofs of the surrounding houses. The shops were closed, but the pretty colored lights of the Christmas trees winked in the windows.
Mrs. Pickering's house was beautifully decorated with tinsel and holly, and the rich smell of turkey and sage and onion stuffing wafted from the kitchen. But she had a very worried look on her face as she led me through to the sitting room. Debbie was there, but she wasn't sitting up in her usual position. She was lying quite still and huddled close. And huddled close to her lay a tiny kitten. I looked down in amazement. What have we got here? It's the strangest thing, Miss Pickering replied. I haven't seen her for several weeks, and then she came in about two hours ago, staggered into the kitchen, and she was carrying the kitten in her mouth. She brought it in here and laid it on the rug. Almost immediately, I could see that she wasn't well. Then she lay down like this, and she hasn't moved since. You see the baby kitten? It's a little tiny baby. I knelt on the rug and passed my hand over Debbie's body, which Mrs. Pickering had placed on a piece of sheet. She was very, very thin, and her coat was dirty. I knew that she didn't have long to live. Is she ill, Mr. Harriet? asked Mrs. Pickering in a trembling voice. Yes, yes, I'm afraid so, but I don't think she's in any pain. Mrs. Pickering looked at me, and I saw there were tears in her eyes. Then she knelt beside Debbie and stroked the cat's head while, she, while the tears fell on the dirty fur. Oh, the poor little thing. I should have done more for her. I spoke gently. Nobody could have done more than you. Nobody could have been kinder. And see, she has brought you her kitten, hasn't she? Yes, you are right. She has. Mrs. Pickering reached out and lifted up the tiny bedraggled kitten. Isn't it strange? Debbie knew she was dying, so she brought her kitten here. And on Christmas Day, I bent down and put my hand on Debbie's heart. There was no beat. I'm afraid she has died. I lifted the feather-like body, wrapped it in a piece of sheet, and took it out to the car. Sad. When I came back, Mrs. Pickering was still stroking the kitten. The tears had dried, and she was bright-eyed as she looked at me. I've never had a cat before, she said. I smiled. Well, it looks as though you've got one now. So we had some sadness, but we also have some happiness here, too. And she certainly had. The kitten grew rapidly into a sleek, handsome, and bouncy tabby cat, and Mrs. Pickering called him Buster. He wasn't timid like his little mother, and he lived like a king, and with the ornate collar he always wore, he looked like one, too. Looks like quite the rascal, too. <laughs> I watched him grow up with delight, but the occasion that always stays in my mind was the following Christmas Day, a year after his arrival. I was on my way home after visiting a farmer with a sick cow, and I was looking forward to my Christmas dinner. Mrs. Pickering was at her front door when I passed her house, and I heard her call out, Merry Christmas, Mr. Harriet. Come in and have a drink to warm you up. I had a little time to spare, so I stopped the car and went in. In the house, there was all the festive cheer of last year and the same glorious whiff of sage and onion stuffing. But this year, there was no sorrow. There was Buster. He was darting up to each of the Basset Hounds in turn, ears pricked, eyes twinkling, dabbing a paw at them and then streaking away. Mrs. Pickering laughed. Buster does tease them so. He gives them no peace. She was right. For a long time, the dogs had led a rather sedate life, gentle walks with their mistress, plenty of good food, and long snoring sessions on the rugs and armchairs. Then Buster arrived. He was now dancing up to the youngest dog again, head to one side, asking him to play. When he started boxing him with both paws, it was too much for the basset who rolled over with the cat in a wrestling game. 
Come into the garden, said Mrs. Pickering. I want to show you something. She lifted a hard rubber ball from the sideboard and we went outside. She threw the ball across the lawn and Buster bounded after it over the frosty grass, his tabby coat gleaming in the sun. He seized the ball in his mouth, brought it back to his mistress, dropped it at her feet and waited. Mrs. Pickering threw it again and again and Buster brought it back. Hmm. I didn't know cats did that. See the dogs watching. <laughs> I gasped. A retriever cat. The Bassets looked on unimpressed. Nothing would ever make them chase a ball. But Buster did it again and again as though he would never tire of it. Mrs. Pickering turned to me. Have you ever seen anything like that? No, I replied. He's a most remarkable cat. We went back into the house where she held Buster close to her, laughing as the big cat purred loudly. Looking at him so healthy and contented, I remembered his mother who had carried her tiny kitten to the only place of comfort and warmth that she had ever known. Mrs. Pickering was thinking the same thing because she turned to me and although she was smiling, her eyes were thoughtful. Debbie would be pleased, she said. I nodded, yes, she would. It was just a year ago today that she brought him in, wasn't it? That's right, she hugged Buster again. The best Christmas present I ever had.